closer to like actually having modern applications. That makes sense. When it beeps, I'll start. <laughs> okay, so um, I thought today I would do a couple of case studies and what I think I will do is try to talk for no more than no more than 20 minutes um, about a statistical mechanics problem uh, since uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, critical systems at this TASI. Uh, and then for the last two-thirds of my time I'll talk about uh, QCD, Lattice QCD. So let's start with uh, critical systems. So this is a picture from David Simmons Duffin's TASI 2015 lectures. He gave these beautiful, beautiful lectures on conformal bootstrap. It was the first time I ever saw that subject. And towards the end of it, uh, he had a picture. And this is a picture of, in his conventions, of two of the exponents, uh, relevant exponents, in the uh, three-dimensional Ising model. Okay? And um, so the outer, so the little sliver right there is all of this self-consistent uh, conformal bootstrap business, calculating where where the critical exponents ought to be, and the box around the outside is labeled Monte Carlo, and um, this looks bad for Monte Carlo, okay? <laughs> except, except until you when you go look up the papers. So uh, David's calculation with the little sliver was 2015, and the Monte Carlo was from 2010. Okay, uh, it's better to be first. Okay, there's a long history. There's a long history of, of calculating critical exponents uh, with Monte Carlo methods, and um, so I was going to talk about those those things today. So the man who did the uh, big box out there is a guy named Martin Hazenbush, and I've referenced his paper in the notes, and it's a very nice paper to read. It's, it's reasonably, you know, for a technical paper, it's reasonably readable. Okay. And um, so I'm going to tell you how he did it. How he did it was using a technique called finite size scaling. And this, again, is something which is in textbooks, but maybe I own, own a different set of textbooks than you do. Okay? So I wrote down some scaling relations up here, tip four, and I'm going to use Greek letters because that's how I think about statistical mechanics. You have some susceptibility, and it diverges at the critical point, you know, like t minus tc to a minus power. You have a correlation length which diverges at the critical length with an exponent nu, and we can, com we can trade t minus tc for a correlation length. The susceptibility scales like the correlation length to a power, okay? And these are relations that are true in infinite volume, okay? But, um, of course, on a, in a computer program and in, in the laboratory, you never have infinite volume. You always have finite volume. And so there are two, typically two length scales uh, whenever you're doing an experiment or whenever you're doing a numerical experiment. And one of them is the correlation length, which you can tune by you know, tuning relevant operators. And the other is the size of your box, okay? And, um, if the correlation length is much smaller than the size of your box, the system is basically infinite in size, 
and you will get corrections to these things, which are basically like exponential, e to the minus correlation length divided by the length. They'll be small, okay? And so you might as well think about your system as having an infinite size. But if you tune yourself closer and closer to criticality, then at some point the correlation length, huh? Um, the correlation length should be small compared to the size of the box, okay? When the correlation length is small compared to the size of the box, you're in an infinite system. However, um, if your correlation length becomes large compared to the size of the box, okay, then your system knows about the size of the box, okay? And people used to do experiments uh, on slabs. Uh, they would look for crossover behavior, right? And when the correlation length is smaller than the thickness of the slab, you expect to see three-dimensional exponents, but then you expect to see crossover. The exponential corrections are e to the minus big thing. Yeah, yeah, the exponential corrections go like e to the minus, uh, let's say, l over c, when l is gigantic compared to c. I'm a particle physicist, so this is like, uh, those of us that do lattice QCD, we worry about correlation lengths as one over the pion mass, and we look for corrections of this size in, when we do things. Okay, so the issue is, what, with finite size scaling, is that when, so your coral, you try to tune uh, to the critical temperature where your correlation length diverges, okay, except that your correlation length can't get bigger than the size of the box. A highbrow way to say what's going on is that 1 over L, the size of the box, is a relevant perturbation. But physically, right, your correlation length can't be bigger than the size of the box. And what that means is that if you're in a finite size system, you don't have singularities. It's, of course, you know, you don't get phase transitions in finite volume. And so what we should do is we should try to replace this function right here, uh, which is the function in a box of infinite size, by something which knows about uh, the two size scales in the system. So let's write this as gamma over nu times some function of, and the only two length scales we have are the correlation length and the size of the box, okay? So this is how we expect susceptibilities to behave in finite volume, okay? And you could look at this thing. We don't know anything about what this function is. Sometimes you can calculate it, but mostly you can't. One of the things that we know about is that if this argument goes to zero, if, if the argument of the function goes to zero, this thing should go to a constant so that you recover uh, the textbooky things right there, okay? And what we can do is we can start trading correlation length and temperature and whatnot, right? We could substitute here. Uh, we could replace this we can take this function, and if, if the only two length scales that are interesting are L and C, we, of course, can write this as L to the gamma over nu times some other function psi, uh, say, which is, I don't know, uh, right? We could still write it as a, as a ratio of the scaling variables. And let's do something here where we, uh, we promote C into T minus TC okay, and then keep the L behavior around, and I'll just cut to the chase and write this as L to the 1 over nu times T minus TC, just to raise everything to a power, so I have chi as a function of T minus TC to the power 1. And it's accompanied by L to the minus nu because it's C over L, okay? And um, so this is some function, again, we have no idea what it is, but we can sketch it, okay, it will be a function that will look, say, psi as a function of v, right? It'll look something like this. What the hell, right? And it'll have some maximum place, uh, v0, and it'll have a width, let's call it delta v. And if that's the case, that says that chi has a peak someplace. It's got a peak at, uh, I need another blackboard, but we can, I've got another blackboard here. We can erase the scaling things. Let's, let's write things here. It's got a peak at uh, L to the 1 over nu uh, T minus TC is equal to V0. So we can invert this thing. It's got a peak at T 
is equal to Tc plus uh, V0 L to the minus 1 over nu. Right? The function has a peak. The susceptibility peaks when the, when the temperature is equal to the critical temperature plus volume corrections. Okay? And it's got a width uh, in temperature, which is V1 to the L go to the, times L to the minus 1 over nu. And so what this means is that if you look at the susceptibility okay, uh, as a function of temperature, let me try to sketch it right here. Okay, as the volume gets bigger, the peak in the susceptibility uh, scales as uh, L to the gamma over nu. That is, your susceptibility peaks and peaks and peaks as the volume gets bigger and bigger because it's trying to go, it's trying to go critical, right? So you have a peak that moves, and you have a location for the peak that scales like L to the minus 1 over nu. And remember when I was talking about second order phase transitions a couple of lectures ago, uh, I said you can usually see something going on in a simulation, but you may not necessarily know what is going on. Imagine that you're doing simulations on something like the three-dimensionalizing model or some system that has a critical point in it, and you're measuring, so, you know, you're looking for the phase transition. If, you're, if the volume of your box is too small, what you see is this little bump which isn't doing anything, and then you make the, vo make the box bigger, and the position of the, the, where the critical point is, you know, where you have the bump, shifts a little bit, and the height goes up, and it shifts, and the height goes up. So to establish that you have a second order phase transition, uh, you have to see a peak in the susceptibility, and then the peak has to vary uh, as you vary the volume. Okay? So this is a game you can play to look for criticality in, in simulations. You can, do, uh, you can do what amounts to curve collapse, right? You can take data at different temperatures, and you can try to map this curve. I mean, it's the same, right? It's, this, it's a function of, uh, where did I have it? There's this, uh, well, I lost it. But there, there's a universal curve, which is a function of, uh, of the, the size of the system, where you are, various other parameters. This is a game that you can play. Okay? Um, I've actually played this game, and I'll show you a picture in just a second. You could say, I'll calculate the correlation length itself okay, for some system which is going critical. And let's write down the analog formula, say, the correlation length will scale with the system size times something which is L to the 1 over nu T minus Tc. Again, that's the same factor that I had up there. Uh, the thing I was doing, uh, the T minus Tc, I was doing these near conformal systems that we were all addicted to uh, in Lattice Beyond Standard Model a few, a few years ago. And there, the relevant operator was the fermion mass, okay? And the way you went critical in a near conformal system is you tune the fermion mass to zero, okay? And so what I was looking at was correlation length uh, divided by length of the system uh, versus, uh, let's say, quark mass L to the power, we called it Y sub M. But you're looking for an exponent in this game. You're looking for the relevant exponent. And the game that I played, let's see if I click on the picture here, will it come back? What do I have to do? Uh, it went to sleep. Does it, does it come back to life? Ah, OK, good. Uh, no, this is, this, let's back up. OK, OK, so this is, this is a picture. Why the hell? I hate computers. Um, this is a picture from a paper which is referenced in one of Max's papers. Is he still here? This is a plot. So Max was interested a few years ago uh, in the Abelian Higgs model, OK? And uh, it has two coupling constants. And there's a line of transitions uh, in a two-dimensional coupling constant space. And people were interested in knowing whether the transition was first order or second order. And so what, what this is, is a measure of the peak height of the susceptibility uh, as a function of volume, okay? 
And so uh, one of these things, there's a characteristic volume scaling of, of a susceptibility, and then someplace else there was a different scaling. And what these guys were doing were arguing, well, the transition is different with the black dots than it is with the white dots. This is just looking at the peak of the susceptibility. This is a game that you can play. Uh, yeah, this is an example of curve collapse where I've got data for correlation length divided by length of the box and I'm plotting it as a function of, of m l to the y and I'm tuning the parameter y and here you can see there's a whole bunch of symbols and they don't sit on top of each other and then they're more coincident and they're more coincident and then they kind of fall apart and what I'm tuning, doing is I'm tuning this exponent right here and I'm attempting to determine the exponent by doing curve collapse. This is a way of measuring anomalous dimensions or measuring scaling dimensions. Okay. Uh, I don't know why my, should I try going into, let's try going into full screen. Uh, yes, that works a little bit better. Okay, so now we're to Mr. Hasenbusch, okay? And I can tell you what he did, okay? So what Hasenbusch did, he was doing simulations of models that were in the Ising model universality class, okay? And one of them was the three-dimensional Ising model, Okay, and he was doing finite size scaling, and he wanted to do all of this. Uh, you know, he wanted to extract exponents from the uh, uh, basically from the behavior of correlation functions. And let's pull this thing down because we don't need this anymore. We can keep the magic thing up high there. Okay, and so as you might imagine, one of the things that you need in order to measure exponents very accurately is a big aspect ratio and the sizes of the system that you use, okay? Um, and if you remember lecture one, critical slowing down, right? Monte Carlo is diffusive, so the correlation time in your simulations goes roughly like the square of the correlation length. So that's bad, okay? So what he had to do, the first thing he had to do was to solve that problem, and it turns out that for systems like the Ising model, there are what are called cluster algorithms. You can go through and update big patches of spins and you can reduce the critical slowing down from something which is diffusive down to a very small power, okay? And this is very high tech, but, so I won't tell you about it, but he did it. And then the second thing that he had to worry about is that these formulas up here are not good enough. Let me write down what actually happens, okay? So you have a susceptibility, uh, and in, he's looking at, say, the uh, the, the susceptibility and the correlation function, so the exponent is 2 minus eta, okay? Uh, 1 plus b, right? There's more to life than just the leading exponent, and there's more to life, you are theorists, but I hate to tell you, uh, there is dirt in everything. There are the things that you guys like to talk about, which are the power law things, but there's constant terms as well because that's life, okay? And um, you, can measure the, you can measure exponents from many different operators, right? Think about it, you know, you invent some spin susceptibility and then you invent a spin susceptibility and multiply it by something. There's a bazillion operators you can write down that couple uh, to the same exponent, okay? And the green line right here and the blue line right here come from studying two systems which are in the Ising model universality class and you do all this finite size scaling business and you completely ignore this term right here and you get an excellent fit to the correlation for the two models as a function of, and here he's doing scale collapse so he's got some exponent right here to make everything look nice and you get this number and this number and it all looks beautiful and this guy and this guy differ by 20 standard deviations. Okay, so you should worry. Okay, and then we see this improved business right here, which is the number that he published. So how did he deal, so how do you deal with this thing? Okay, well, it turns out that uh, the coefficient right here, the exponents are universal, the coefficient is not universal. And so what he did in order to do the problem, it's very clever, he simulated not just the Ising model, right? H is minus beta uh, SI SI plus mu plus H 
SI. He also simulated something called the Bloom Capel model, which is kind of a dilute Ising model. And you might hear about this guy again when people talk about superconformal, whoever is doing the superconformal lectures next week. Uh, SI, SI plus mu uh, plus H, SI, but it's got an extra term. It's got a term D SI squared. And the idea here is that here the spins are plus or minus 1. You could imagine a situation where the spins are plus or minus 1 or there isn't a spin there. Okay, right? So you can think of the spins as being uh, plus or minus 1 or 0. And this term right here, depending on its sign, says I would like the spins to be plus or minus 1 or I would not like them to be plus or minus 1. So we have an extra parameter. So you can think of something like uh, D and beta as part of your space. And it turns out for this model right here, there's a, a line of second order transitions that come up in the, you know, in the bare parameter space. Uh, this would be the Ising model, D is equal to 0. But these guys are all in the Ising model universality class. There's a tricritical point, and then uh, it go, you have a first order transition up here. Okay? And the tricritical point is interesting because for the two-dimensional Ising model, at the tricritical point, it's super, it's super conformal. That's uh, Steve Shankar and Friedan and somebody else result from 30 years ago. Okay? But this guy right here is in the Ising model universality class. Okay? And so what you do is you do simulations not just with the uh, 3D Ising model, but with this Bloom Capel guy. Okay? This coefficient is not universal. Okay, um, And then you can play other games. You can invent operators which basically have the same quantum numbers as chi. The QCD people in the back, we do this all the time. You invent some operator which uh, happens to uh, couple right, to, the leading, you know, to, the leading, uh, to the leading relevant operator right here, but it doesn't couple so well uh, to the non-leading operator. So you're trying to knock this guy out. Okay? And you do that. And that's these things right here, OK? And you're supposed to look at this and see a blue thing and a, and a red thing. And they're different calculations. And they give you the same answer, OK? So this is how you measure. This is how it's really clever. This, I mean, this was not, this was not just stupid run, run simulations for years. There is a lot of thinking here. Yeah. Um, they are the same. They, the, so the question is, are there multiple omegas floating around? And I believe that the answer is no. There is one non-leading non -leading operator that every, no, there's a tower of, you know conformal field theory better than me, right? There's a, there's a whole collection of, of operators with their own exponents, OK? Uh, so this would be a non-leading exponent uh, with the same quantum numbers as, uh, you know, as the operator that carries the leading exponent. Mm -hmm. Because also that's the one that he cites, like 0.83. Yeah. But then there is, if you're talking about this spin correlation function, then there is also some leading one, but it's a completely different uh, symmetry sector that go outside the symmetry sector. It's much bigger. So, yeah, anyway, it's a bit technical. It's a bit technical. I am, I am not completely sure. I know, that, I know that what he was after was the leading exponents, <laughs> OK? Because what they actually end up doing, this is a plot of nu here as well with many operators coming in, is they never determine this omega parameter very well. I mean, the uncertainty on that guy is like uh, plus or minus 30%, OK? But he doesn't care about that. He wants the leading exponents. He wants eta and nu. So he doesn't really care very much about omega, OK? But the deal was that he had to be very careful. He could, just not, he could not take his data and simply fit it to this guy right here. Okay? He could not get a stable fit. He could not look at different operators. This is a plot of nu, the correlation length. And he's got a whole load of different quantities that couple to, uh, that coupled, uh, that, you know, that couple to nu. And here he is plotting all of these guys as they approach 
uh, the scaling limit as L goes to infinity. Okay? And so the point of his calculation is I compute all these things and then in the scaling limit uh, they all give me the same answer and then he will stare at this thing and try to say there is some intrinsic uncertainty in what he's doing. So this is kind of a blown up plot right here, uh, kind of with bad scales. Here L is getting bigger, he's got a whole bunch of operators and a whole bunch way of fitting things and the thing that he is happy with is that as you come together and you can't see things up here, 6298, 6299, 63, 6301, right? All of his operators, it's a numerical thing, are, are coming together at the at part per thousand level. Okay, so that's how, that's how he did the box. And so I will finish by writing down two numbers here, uh, which were the ones that he was trying to compute, you know, five years before the conformal bootstrap guys. Uh, of course, they have much tighter error bars, uh, but the punchline at this level, so he had, so nu is 0 0.63002 with an error of 10, and eta, which is 0 0.03627 with an error of 10. Um, but I have to say, one of our cameramen is a condensed matter experimentalist, okay? And I'm the kind of a theorist that thinks experimentalists are more important. Uh, 0 0.632 with an error of 2. Okay. 63002 with an error here of 1 from him. But this is experiment, right? 10 times bigger error bar. 0 0.041 with an uncertainty of 5. And in 2010, Mr. Hasenbusch thought he had done well enough. And I have to agree with him. Okay, You know, until you come along and say, this is pi squared over 15. It's just a number. Okay, So this is how you do these. This is an example of, of a numerical calculation of critical exponents using finite size scaling. Okay, And yes, comment away. Yes. So he actually gave a number how long it would take him to turn a factor of 10 better yes. than he did. It would take him 2,000 years. Yes. <laughs> yes. So Th he didn't do better because he couldn't do better. Uh, he, he, did, he did as well as he could. And I'm surprised you have such pathetic experimentalists. I thought you said that Boulder in physics department is one of the best in the world. Yeah, but we don't Why care. Don't they measure this better? <laughs> okay, so you don't do it with atoms. Okay. So, 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 so Slava is giving me a hard time. Okay. So, um, so item one, he said, uh, Hasenbusch was an honest guy and to do better would have taken 2,000, 2000 times the computer power. But, you know, nine years later, you can probably purchase it. Okay. So if you like programming GPUs, here's a project. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Slava is also giving us a hard time here in Boulder. Uh, why, you know, we are high precision guys. Uh, and the answer is you don't do this with condensed atom gases. Okay, this is solid state physics. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so that's 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 example number one. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Uh, okay, QCD. Uh, so what I'm going to do is now switch over and show you some QCD pictures. And there was a couple of things from before that I wanted to go back and fill in on. Okay, so I was talking about just running a Monte Carlo, okay, and you know, you start off with some initial configuration and you run it for a while and you decide that you are in equilibrium. And in the notes, I didn't feel like getting the computer out uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I put a picture in there. This is from some random simulation. I don't even know how many colors this is, okay, I just went looking through my files. This is an example of a Monte Carlo run where I started off someplace. This is obviously some, some QCD thing because it says plaquette right there. And I'm measuring some observable and you can see how it varies like all hell at the start. And then at some point it starts bouncing around, okay? And so the idea would be any, any Monte Carlo person in the room would look and say, you're not in equilibrium over here. And then at some point you're probably in equilibrium but you have to go off and do tests. 
Okay, so this is just an example. And the other thing that all of you can see is that there are these little bouncy things in the data as I collect data, and the little bouncy things are about this wide. Okay, so those are the time autocorrelations that you have to worry about. Okay, so this is really raw data. This is stuff that uh, we would not show. You people should not see this data. Okay, I would have to kill you. Um, okay, if you talk about it. This is another picture. Uh, so remember how the story is that as the lattice spacing goes to zero, you are supposed to see universal behavior. Nowadays, lattice groups tend not to make pictures uh, with everybody's data showing what a good job they did, or maybe I'm just lazy. This is a picture from 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, there were four groups who were all measuring the same thing with different actions. And this is an example of kind of experimental universality. So the people who have the purple little crosses right here would be measuring this quantity, and then they would be saying that it interpolates, you know, it extrapolates in the continuum moment to a value over here. And the blue octagon people would be doing the same thing, and the green cross people would be doing the same thing, and the black box people would be doing the same thing, and certainly uh, there is a, a prediction, uh, right, from these four groups of this particular observable in the limit that A goes to zero. And this is the way, even nowadays, that we analyze things. If you were interested in, say, G minus two, okay, there's a, pe my friends are killing themselves to calculate hadronic vacuum polarization for G minus two because there's an experiment out there. And this is high stakes, okay, right? Uh, these guys measure something, maybe there's physics beyond the standard model. Okay, this is not some, you know, this is not some theorist thing. This is, this, this is real, okay? <laughs> and so everybody will have pictures that look like this, and they are all hoping, all the lattice people, of course, they would like to be this guy right here because uh, obviously there's no slope on this line, and so the, the extrapolation is smallest. Um, you who don't do this for a living, you want to see analog pictures like this because you want to see several groups doing things, okay? Uh, let's see, what am I going on to here? Oh, and then one more thing. Remember, I was telling you how to fit masses. So I went off and I found a typical picture of a correlator. Uh, remember, we were fitting exponentials. This is a hyperbolic cosine. That's because you have boundaries. Okay, so uh, periodic boundary conditions. This is a typical correlator, and the slope on this line is how we calculate masses, and the intercept is how we calculate matrix elements. Okay, this is kind of like a picture of, well, nobody's shown any pictures yet, but somebody will show a picture of some boring thing that you guys do for a living uh, that you don't show to lattice people. This is our analog for that. Okay, so where are we? Okay, good. So big picture, okay? Big picture. Uh, QCD and its relatives, and by that I mean uh, non-abelian gauge fields, some small number of fermions, no scalars, uh, things that look like QCD. Um, there's three things that those theories all have. They're asymptotically free, they're confining, and if the fermion masses are small, they are chirally broken. Okay? This is generic behavior for the things that we study. Um, of those three things, asymptotic freedom, well, we use that fact, right? We're tuning the lattice spacing to zero by going to the Gauss Gaussian fixed point. Uh, phenomenologists like to talk about lambda parameters, lambda QCD, lambda MS bar, da, 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 okay? Um, sometimes we compute lambda QCD, okay, uh, as a function, you know, from other masses. So you come to me and say, the Rho meson has a mass of 750 MeV, or 770, or whatever it is, what is the value of the lambda parameter? Or in the particle data book, people care about what is alpha strong at the z-pole, okay? And you get that from uh, calculating, you know, from, from, from other observables. That's because the ratio of the lambda parameter to, I don't know, the proton mass, you know, that's a pure number in QCD, and it's just a question, which number do you want to take to fit the other one with? Uh, confinement. Um, so there's, as I said, there's no proof of confinement, okay, for these interesting theories, uh, but we are interested, hold that thought, we are interested in consequences, like what's the mass of the N star 1238, okay, yes, question. Uh, are there ways of predicting like, the existence of new space, like, kind of like Absolutely, absolutely, there are people that try to do that. The, but the question is, can you predict the existence of new states? Absolutely, okay. 
This is bread and butter for us, okay? So for ex an, an example of new states, are there new states of two B quarks and two anti-up quarks, okay? Uh, and you might think that there would be because B quarks are really, really heavy and there are certainly bound states of one B quark and two up quarks and, you know, heavy quark, who cares if it's two heavy quarks, okay? And then the question is, well, they're not infinitely heavy, so let's do simulations, okay? Um, what's hard is uh, there are these, you know, if you can't write down a good interpolating field, okay, then, then, uh, then it's typically hard to do a good simulation uh, just because, uh, let's go back to the exponential right here, you know, you, you, you don't couple very well to the state and so you're looking for an exponential hidden under other exponentials. So it gets technical. But I mean, there are people that are, you know, people desperately try to do that, okay? Uh, uh, sad story for a lot of these things, the guys who do quark models can, can beat us to it, but we don't like to say that because quark model is uncontrolled, okay? Um, but this is one of the things that we try to do. Clearly, matri you know, new states, we love it, okay? Uh, okay, good. Uh, so that, that would be an, an example of consequences of confinement, okay? New states. Uh, chiral symmetry breaking, okay? Uh, again, there's no uh, first principle story of, you know, what is the dynamical mechanism for chiral symmetry breaking? Uh, and tell me a dynamical story, and then by the way, do a controlled calculation of something. You know, there's plenty of stories, but when, you know, actually getting a number out, that's, that's, that's hard. Um, but, uh, but for us, actually, uh, chiral symmetry breaking is, is a big, you know, it's kind of a classic thing. Uh, think about effective field theories, right? There's some fundamental physics up there in the sky, and then there's an effective field theory down here, and the effective field theory down on the ground has got fundamental parameters in it, but those fundamental parameters are determined by the theory up in the sky. That's like everything, right? You know, you know, beyond the standard model, where the hell did the quark masses come from, right? Some theory up in the sky. For us, the theory up in the sky is QCD, and the low energy theory is, you know, some nonlinear sigma model with its own parameters, the condensate, F pi, things like that. So we're in the business of calculating things like that. Okay, and then the idea is you go to some nuclear physicist and you tell him what F pi is and you tell him what the condensate is and then bitty, 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 off he goes. Okay, same thing with beyond standard model physics. There are people who really love the idea that the Higgs is composite, okay, and there's new stuff up in the sky and so the new stuff up in the sky should tell you, uh, you know, Higgs physics things. And there are people that try to, you know, you come to me and tell me some model, bitty, 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 I calculate it for you, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, so there's a lattice ideology, uh, and the lattice ideology is very, very bare, okay? We simulate SUN gauge theory with NF flavors of quarks, and the masses are what they are, and we give you an answer. And the answer is our prediction of QCD without model dependence, okay? You go to the lattice conference, that's what you have to say. Um, and it works, okay? Uh, the thing, since most of you don't do hadronic physics, the things you have to try to look for are these little dots, which are various calculations, and little black lines, which are from the particle data book, and the little black lines and the predictions sit on top of themselves. And there's this whole big set of spectroscopy. And I could go to another picture here, which I will refer to. This is the spectroscopy when you have uh, heavy quarks around. And it works, okay? Now, the story, we solve the theory and this is the answer, okay? Um, that's not just us, that's a typical story, okay? Uh, think about high order QED. Uh, think about conformal bootstrap, bitty, 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 and then here's this little sliver, okay? And it's not pi squared over 15, it's a little sliver, okay? Uh, so it's a typical story in theoretical physics, okay? You know, I do some calculation, this is the answer that I get. However, uh, while it is typical, perhaps it is an unsatisfactory story. So I can't resist putting in a quote from Fermi here, uh, just because I'm an old guy. Uh, Fermi said to someone else once, uh, there are two ways of doing theoretical physics. One way, and this is the way I prefer, is to have a clear physical picture of the process you are calculating. The other is to have a precise and self-consistent mathematical formulation. Okay. That's a nice, that's an inspirational quote. He went, then went on to say, you have neither, okay? <laughs> and I believe he was talking to Freeman Dyson, 
Okay. Uh, so, is there a story? Now, what the hell's going on here? Why did it die? I hate computers. I hate this. I really hate this. Go to. So, why did it die? <laughs> okay. So, is there a story that might satisfy Fermi? Okay. And in fact, there are several stories that would, that would have satisfied Fermi. Okay. And they are all variations on an analogous story that I certainly tell students when I teach quantum mechanics here. Uh, we are all atomic physicists here in Boulder. And the analog story is the Wigner-Eckhart theorem. Okay. Most of the time, okay, so the stories that you use to describe physics, okay, uh, are variations on the Wigner-Eckhart theorem, okay? Uh, you have a symmetry. You want to calculate some matrix element, and you have a symmetry, okay, that tells you part of the answer for the matrix element, okay? And, if you're, and, and you go on and you say, I understand things because I understand the symmetry, so I can calculate the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. But the story is incomplete because you can't calculate the reduced matrix element. And these are the kind of stories that you can use to talk about QCD. They can give you the analog of the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient, but they can't give you the analog of the reduced matrix element. And examples of such stories uh, would be the following. The largest of these stories is, the, is a TUF large N scaling. See, I'm about to tell you how to understand pictures like this, okay, at least as long as you stay away from people that do lattice gauge theory, okay. Um, and the other two stories would be uh, heavy quark uh, effective field theory uh, or non-relativistic QCD, okay. And all of these stories have, uh, have a formula like this underneath them, okay, where some kind of symmetry here or some kind of dynamics tells you about the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient, but the reduced matrix element, like the actual mass of the proton or something like that, is not accessible to the story, okay? So, uh, yeah, so let's begin thinking about uh, non-relativistic QCD, okay? So non-relativistic QCD, uh, the effective field theory uh, that you used to think about non-relativistic QCD is to write down a Hamiltonian which is organized, uh, which is an expansion in, uh, in velocity, okay? And what you can do is you can compose a Hamiltonian, uh, you know, a set of operators, say C1 p squared over 2m, C, C2 times some analog of q times phi plus other coefficients times p dot e or e dot b or things like that. And the way you determine the coefficients is you calculate various amplitudes in the effective field theory. You calculate various amplitudes in full QCD. They are theorist amplitudes. They have nothing to do with spectroscopy. You fix the coefficients. Okay? That's how you do effective field theory. And then the pictures here, the colored blobs are here Let's look at the charmonium spectrum, which is this part of the spectrum right here. We're actually done by people doing non-relativistic QCD. That's what they had on their computers. They were not doing full QCD. Okay? Um, and the, uh, the analog of the Klebsch-Gordon formula over there is matrix elements of operators are some expansion coefficient Vn O sub n where you know what the power of the velocity is, you know what the operator is, but you don't know what the appropriate reduced matrix element is. Okay? NRQCD is actually, we can take it down one more level and make it simpler at the price of being uncontrolled. Because non-relativistic QCD, right, okay, let's be naive. It's basically particles in a potential. You have heavy quarks. Okay? Uh, and we know what the potential looks like. You can't derive the potential up here, okay? But 
we, we, are, we are theorists. We're allowed to do dirty things. Uh, you have V of R, which is alpha over R plus sigma R, OK? And you could calculate the spectrum of CC bar pairs or BB bar pairs, OK? You can't do it for top quarks because the top quark beta decays before it forms bound states, OK? Useful thing to know. Um, and what this will give you is uh, it's like hydrogen, right? You have the, the, thrip, the triplet S1 and the singlet S0 state, and then you have radial recurrences, and then you have P waves, OK? You can reproduce basically all the spectroscopy that you see, sort of, OK? Uh, this is an old, 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 old story, OK? So old that you probably don't know it anymore, OK? Uh, because this is what people were doing in 1974 and 1977, OK? Um, the modern story, this thing is not dead, OK? You were asking me back there about spectroscopy. People are interested. Are there bound states of anti-B quarks and charm quarks? And if so, where are there? OK? This is part of the program at uh, LHCB to find these funny states. And the lattice people are crank, 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 crank. And the quark model people are crank, 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 crank. OK? Are there bound states of BB, U bar, U bar states? Yeah, it's fun, right? I mean, come on. I, I love QCD. It's a good thing to look for. Uh, yeah. Uh, this was very important. This did a fatal thing to theoretical physics in 1974. What did potential models do to theoretical physics in 1974? It killed string theory, OK? Back then, there was string theory for hadronic physics, OK? And then people discovered charmonium. And then nothing happened for nine years, OK? Uh, OK, good. So the, the problem with things like this, and the reason why you want to do real calculations, is the following. It's the fine structure, OK? Uh, again, think back to when you took graduate or undergraduate quantum mechanics. Where does fine structure come from, OK? Uh, and part of it comes because the E turns into B, because it's the fourth component of a four vector, and part of it is Thomas precession. So the problem is uh, the confining potential. You know, is it a scalar? Is it a vector? Nobody knows. Okay, and so you have to simulate things. So that's a place where this story would fail. Okay, uh, heavy quark effective theory. So here we have particles called the D meson and the D sub s, and then there's a D star someplace that doesn't seem to have made it onto the picture right here. Um, so there's another story, uh, heavy quark effective theory, which is basically an expansion in 1 over the mass of the heavy quark. OK? So we have H is a power series in 1 over the mass of the heavy quark. And this would be appropriate for things like bound states of a light quark and a heavy quark, or a light quark and two heavy quarks, or maybe two light quarks and a heavy quark, and so on. And they are two, they're two different expansion parameters. The expansion in terms of velocity has different coefficients than the expansion in terms of 1 upon m. Uh, yeah, the natural dimensionless parameter, it's a slightly dirty one. Uh, let me, can I go phenomenological on you? Would basically be the lambda parameter divided by the mass of the quark. That's what people would say. Or some confinement scale, some gluonic scale. Okay, so this is a few hundred MeV divided by the quark mass. Okay, similarly with expansion and powers of V, what the hell did velocity come from, right? You have to tell some story there again about you know, confinement scale, radius, or something like that versus mass. The physical picture for the things like this, okay, I will tell you even though I hate the terminology. So the idea is you have this heavy quark at the center of your meson, and then you have all the light stuff going around it, and the characteristic size for the light stuff is like, you know, a Fermi or something like that, and the heavy guy is just heavy. The words I don't like, but Harvard students have heard them. Uh, there's a Howard Georgi expression uh, for the light stuff going around. He calls it the brown muck. Well, I spend my life calculating the brown muck, so I, OK. So be it, be, but what this will tell you, uh, theories like this will tell you that the splitting between, say, the spin 0 and spin 1 D mesons and the splitting between the spin 1, 0, and spin 1, B mesons, 
replace a charm quark by a bottom quark, are roughly the same. So you have a story here, uh, say, matrix elements, okay, scale like sum over characteristic powers, uh, I don't know. You don't know what this number is uh, that goes with the mass. You don't know what the size of the coefficient. That's a typical effective field theory story. You can argue sort of how big something is, but you have no idea what the coupling constant is. Okay? Okay, so, so much for that. And then finally, uh, it took large n, so it'll come to life in a second. Um, if you have not read it, okay, you should all go out and find a 1979 paper by Ed Witten called uh, Baryons and the Large N Expansion, okay? And he wrote this paper before he was doing mathematics. And it's a beautiful, beautiful paper. You could give it to an undergraduate, OK? It is the most perfect exposition of large n counting that there is. He's nodding. I mean, we read, I mean, this is a classic paper from our youthhood, right? OK. So I'm supposed to tell you to read things, OK? And um, the, you're going to see a lot about large n later on, right? And you know, to look at things, one index large n, o n models, OK? 2-index large n, this is the poster child right here, a TUF large n limit. More index large n, that's SYK, uh, it's got a whole different set of regularities. Uh, good, so this is a simple one right here. Uh, large n, if you're a mathematician, I wrote down a Fertz identity up there. Uh, for the few, okay, I'm the only non-mathematician in here. What this says is that you can follow the color through one gluon exchange. Basically, a gluon is a QQ bar pair. OK, uh, if you define the Atuft coupling constant, g squared and c, then the beta function doesn't have any n's in it anymore. And this suggests counting Feynman diagrams where vertices scale like 1 over square root of nc. And then you start writing down Feynman diagrams. Uh, people did this, actually, without looking at Feynman diagrams. It's an expansion in topologies. Okay. And uh, if you're ever around Mr. Veneziano, he will talk about things that way, because that's how he did things. Um, and um, so you start calculating various processes. And at least the uh, light version of this, of this story is that the weight of a graph is given by color counting. You start doing all the color tracing. People that do amplitudes, they play this game uh, also. They work in large n because the color counting is very easy to do. They can color order things, and they don't have to worry about all this funny business. Okay, So the story here is that graph weight is color weight. And then there's a whole series of, of uh, phenomenological things that pop right out. Uh, planar graphs dominate in the, in the limit. Uh, QQ bar pairs, those are holes. They are down by 1 upon nc. There's this whole hierarchy uh, of things. And basically, the bottom line from this story right here is that in large n, mesons are QQ bar pairs. Okay? Large nc is the only way you can justify the quark model, and you want to justify the quark model because it works. Okay? Uh, yeah, and with some mesons. So the analog of the Klebs Gordon formula for large nc is the, uh, let's write down, uh, let's write down the, the analog of the Klebs Gordon coefficient formula right here is that some operator, which depends, calculated uh, as a function of nc, is the sum over uh, nc to characteristic powers p times unknown coefficients c sub p. OK, so you have a power series. So the analog of the klebs gordon coefficient is some power in n. OK? OK, well, I'm, I'm I'm certainly no mathematician, but it seems to me that graph counting seems very naive. I do non-perturbative physics, right? I mean, you know, Feynman graphs, you know, confinement, OK, well, you know, how, do, how does it, but it works, OK? So let's look at some pictures. These are, this is data I generated, and it certainly is nothing special, but it allows us to look at various aspects of QCD, and then the way you should think about things, I'm, I'm telling you a story, but it's a, but it's a good enough story. Uh, think about things from the context of large end. So what we have right here is a plot of the heavy quark potential, OK? And I've scaled the radius in a particular way. And the first thing when you, when you look at this, you see that you have roughly a linear potential up here and that it's curving down right here, uh, headed on in. This is 
Uh, okay, so this is a dirty version of the way we think about heavy quark potential these days, that at long distances it's a linear potential. That's the linear confinement, the thing left over from strong coupling. And then uh, it's plausible to be 1 over r at short distances because what happens at short distances? Asymptotic freedom, Asymptotic freedom absolutely. Okay, And so the potential should interpolate from Coulombic at short distances to linear at long distances, which it more or less does. And if you were back here you know, in 1974, uh, you know, a graduate student at Cornell uh, who signed on with all these guys doing Cornell model, that's the potential that you would use. It took people uh, about three weeks after the discovery of Charmonium to be writing papers about that. Uh, yeah, uh, the other thing, uh, if you're in the front row, you can see there are a lot of plotting symbols right here. Uh, this is actually data from simulations with two, three, four, and five colors of quarks superposed, okay? And they've been scaled, the various data have been scaled so that they, uh, so that they match at some point here, okay? Uh, but really how they were scaled was that uh, when I do a lattice simulation, I have to dial in a Bayer coupling constant, okay? And I, what I did when I did the different values of NC was to dial in the same value of the Atuft coupling constant. So I had a G squared for two colors, which was different than the G squared for three colors, which was different than the G squared for four colors, but G squared N was roughly the same. I actually did it backwards because I wanted to check that. I matched the potential and then I looked at what bare coupling I needed to match everything. And the, uh, working in terms of the Atuf coupling basically matches everything, which is kind of interesting. You know, here's the beta function. This is telling you how everything changes. And in large N, uh, there's no ends here. Uh, let's even get it right, okay? Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, slightly crappy looking picture. This will illustrate two things that you should know about confining theories. One of them is, uh, is the pion really a Goldstone boson? There's a question for it. You know, people come up and tell you the pion is a Goldstone boson. How do they know? Okay. Well, one way that we know this thing is how, suppose that I explicitly break chiral symmetry by giving the quark a mass. How does the pi on mass depend on the quark mass? m pi squared is linear in the quark mass. This is a plot of m pi squared versus the quark mass. You see the straight line. Okay. Uh, physics is supposed to be independent of NC. It is. Okay. So you should believe, right, that it kind of works. Other particles. This is a crummy picture of something which is not a Goldstone boson. So here's some more folklore for you. Goldstone bosons, the mass squared goes like the quark mass. Everybody else, masses are roughly linear in the quark mass, plus a constant. Okay? I can't derive that, it's, but it's a folkloric statement, and it works. Okay? Uh, because uh, at zero quark mass, there are the Goldstone bosons, and then there's everybody else. They're heavier. So it's, you know, so it's not, they're all not going to vanish, okay? And what else is there but linear, right? Uh, let's see, matrix elements. Uh, you can scale matrix elements by appropriate powers of NC, and they sit on top of each other. So Mr. Atuf works, okay? Uh, great. So these are the things that were in Mr. Witten's paper with lots and lots and lots of pictures. I can't remember if the following thing was in his paper. Uh, although it should be. Uh, so we'll talk about baryons. Okay? Baryons in large N. So mesons in large N. It doesn't matter what N is. Does it matter for baryons? Well, you can see it right. Of course it does. Okay? It turns out there's a variety of ways. You can derive a formula, okay, for the mass of a baryon as a function of its spin and the number of colors. And there's a number of ways to get this formula. I'll write it down. There's a lowbrow way to get this formula, and there are highbrow ways to get this formula. Okay. Baryons in large N uh, have a rotor formula. Okay. Um, this part right here, NCM0, uh, there's a lowbrow way of doing things. Imagine that the quarks are heavy and you want to build color singlet objects in NC. 
right? I mean, it, it, this is probably too simple for you because you are mathematicians, but you know, and quarks in a barrier. Uh, this term right here, this is a rotor spectrum. Uh, one way to get this thing is to imagine, right, I have the minimum spin baryon and it's this big lumpy thing, right, you know, with more and more quarks piled into it and then I'm going to put some spin on it, I'm going to rotate it. So the one over NC right here, uh, this is J squared over twice the moment of inertia and the moment of inertia is the mass and baryons are the same in large n so the radius is the same, okay? People who do skirmions, that's the story they would tell. Right, large n, you have all this stuff packed in, heart rate approximation, blah, 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 topological excitation, skirmion, uh, I don't know, I, I, should I say churn Simons? There's something I should say at this point. What is, what is, what is the appropriate mathematical thing I should say back there? You, you don't remember, okay. So um, you don't know where I'm doing. The other thing you can do is you can say, I can get this basically, okay, I'm an old quark model person, from one gluon exchange. Uh, Darula George I glass out 1975. Anyhow, this is a plot of baryon spectroscopy with three, five, and seven baryons. Oh, the other thing which is really beautiful in this stuff, okay, um, there's there's something called a contracted symmetry, okay, and what happens is that uh, in baryons in large n, the isospin is pinned to the spin, okay. Um, I like seeing this from the quark model. Okay, I don't know if this will do you any good, but the nucleon, okay, uh, I'm afraid to ask. What is the spin of the nucleon? Do you know? Does anyone know? Oh, you are such math mathematicians. The nucleon is spin a half, okay? There's a proton and a neutron. The, nu the nucleon is isospin one half. There is a particle called the delta 1238, okay? Uh, it's spin three halves and isospin three halves. On the picture here, uh, we have nucleons uh, with three, five, and seven uh, colors. So what we have here is a j equals one half, j equals three halves, i equals one half, i equals j, uh, five, one halves, three halves, five halves, uh, seven, one halves, three halves, five halves, seven halves, and you can see how the multiplets are coming apart. There's something called Hun's rule, okay? Uh, from 1920 in physics, which says that the spacing between the two levels is proportional to the angular momentum of the bigger one. That's just j plus 1, j plus 2 minus j, j plus 1 is 2j. Okay? And that's what this picture shows right here. Okay? So, you know, you're listening to somebody give you some elaborate talk on, uh, let's see, okay, good, we don't have anything else here. Uh, some elaborate talk on spectroscopy, and this is the story. Okay? Uh, just say, how do I interpret these things with a tough large n? And then the person will be taken aback and then you've already read Mr. Witten's paper and you know how to do things. So let's go back and look at this picture again and try to get some context. There's all these Greek letters down here. Uh, the low guy down here is the pion. Okay, these are the Goldstone bosons. Okay, the lightest guys are Goldstone bosons. Why are they not at zero? Well, God knows why, but the up and down quarks are not zero mass. Okay. Uh, that's very interesting because if they were zero mass, then you wouldn't be talking about the strong CP problem because you could rotate it away. But they really are not at zero mass, and so there's a strong CP problem. Why is theta zero? Because it is. Okay. Uh, some of these guys, oh, here's a kaon. A kaon has a strange quark in it. The strange quark, it's a Goldstone boson, except the kaon uh, has a strange quark in it, and strange quarks are heavier than up and down quarks. Okay, so that's why it's heavier. Uh, you've got other particles over here. There's the anomaly at work. Uh, this guy right here is heavy because he's not a Goldstone boson because he's uh, a flavor singlet, okay? Uh, and the topological guy back there is nodding, okay? You know, there's, there's money in this stuff, okay? Uh, baryons. All these guys over here are baryons uh, and they have an increasing number of strange quarks in them so they get heavier and heavier and heavier. This particle right here is Gelman's uh, Nobel Prize. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, B mesons. Uh, I don't see Bert Richter and Sam Ting's Nobel Prize. They're on the other one here. Oh, and Leon, and Leon Letterman's Nobel Prize too. One Nobel Prize, uh, two Nobel Prize, three Nobel Prizes, okay? Right, okay, good. So um, this is your lightning introduction to strong interaction physics. I think, you know, yes, sir. 
Oh yeah, the big one right here. Okay, uh, because it's hard to calculate. Okay, uh, I can tell you why. Let's let's write down the propagator for a pion. I have some source right here. Uh, let's say let's say I make it with it with an axial current source. So I have a gamma five right here. Okay, and I have a gamma five over here. Okay. I'm going to build a pion for you, so I'm going to consider a pseudoscalar correlator. So what I do is I shoot an up quark across the lattice, and I shoot an anti-down quark across the lattice. Okay, and that you remember that hyperbolic cosine I had that was so beautiful, you wonder why it had little crosses on it. That's data like this. So the eta prime. Okay, uh, do you know the quark content of the eta prime? No. Okay, so it's a flavor singlet. So it's a linear combination of u u bar. Uh, plus d d let's play let's go flavor singlet plus s s bar okay this is something which is clearly s u three symmetric you can do it in your head so so we're gonna we're gonna start off with the source that's u u bar plus d d bar plus s s bar over here and you're gonna get this guy as one of your Feynman diagrams but we're gonna contract it with u u bar plus d d bar plus s s bar and let's say x and y, and now I have to versus u d bar uh, d u bar right x y. This is my pi on. Okay, so there's one contraction, which is a which is this contraction right here, but there's this graph, right? And I should tell you also, when you're reading the QCD literature, um, and this is the way we do things, I, I go out, those of us who are professionals at this, we, we spend you know, millions of, of, of computer hours calculating propagators. Okay? And the eta prime is really noisy because you have to calculate what are called disconnected propagators. They're connected by gluons, right? You know, if you're poetic, but you know, they're, they're okay. And these guys are noisy as all hell. Okay, uh, there's a lot of money in, in calculating discon. No, I, I, you know, seriously, you know, I, these guys are the, the 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 lady sitting next to you is going to go to the lattice conference and she's going to very carefully stay away from all the parallel sessions where they fight about how to calculate these things. Okay, I am not making this up. That's why it's noisy. Wait, is this experimental data? Or no, what this is right here. Okay, what this is this is Monte Carlo. Okay, so so I, I said it once, but I said it really fast. There's all these colored symbols right here. This is a picture from the particle data book. And the black lines that you can barely see are experimental data. And all the little dots right here, uh, there's like four or five kinds of dots in here. And they are from four or five different lattice groups okay, who have calculated the wallet card. Okay? And they've done it with different actions, with different lattices, with different, uh, you know, different kinds of fermions. Da, da 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 all this different stuff, and they've produced all this spectroscopy, and they've taken it very, very carefully, taken the continuum limit. You know, I mean, th this is, and that's the answer. These guys can calculate light hadrons, the light hadron spectrum. It's over. Okay, uh, I, I don't dare show you excited states. Okay, good. Uh, well, uh, let's see. Where the hell am I? What else do? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all going to die anyway, but, huh? <laughs> you flew here, didn't you? <laughs> Did you rent a car in Boulder? <laughs> okay, let me, let me see what else I have to say here. I think I'm, I think I'm done, but I wanted to say a few things. Oh, closing thoughts. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, so I'm done. Uh, I, I'm very much aware that how I do physics is very different from how you do it. Okay? I, I was aware of that before TASI started, and now we're 20% of the way through TASI, and I'm absolutely aware of it. I have to say that both you and I, we do idealizations. Okay? Certainly, you know, the last several lectures. It's not so clear to see what my idealizations are, uh, but they're in there. Okay, maybe that the world is a lattice. I don't know. Uh, the idealizations are based on different tools, but they are tools for all of us that we enjoy using and tools that we actually have the capacity to use. Okay, 
I cannot do mathematics, but I was able to have a career. I'm actually looking forward to the rest of TASI. Okay, I'm the first person to finish his lecture series. Okay, uh, one reason I'm looking forward to the rest of TASI is I really don't want to say anything else. I'm, I'm talked out. Okay, uh, the second thing is I am looking for things that I can work on. Okay, uh, which might be there. And the two categories for things to work on are first of all things that my competition does not know about. Okay, and there are very few lattice people at this TASI. Or, or who know about the things that you are talking about, so I have an edge up. Uh, and I am also looking for things to work on which might be interesting to another audience. Okay? Uh, you are all going to find, if you stay in the field, okay, that the problems that you are doing as graduate students are going to, they will be solved. They will go away. Okay? And you will have to find something else to work on. And um, I think that one of the backstories of TASI is that uh, it is supposed to take you out of your comfort zone. Okay? They don't write it down when you apply. You're supposed to come here and be uncomfortable. Okay? But I think it's a real part of TASI. Uh, certainly it's doing that for me. I've been to many TASIs and, and it's never comfortable. So I, I sincerely hope that I have been able to irritate you a little bit. Okay? So I will stop now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, people are absolutely trying to do those things. Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, he, he asked about pion scattering amplitudes and he asked about the effective theory for the QCD string. I remember uh, Mr. Flauger was playing around with that a few years ago, okay, with the, the effective theory for the QCD string. Um, pion scattering amplitudes, there's actually an active area of research. Okay, and um, there is something in, we are doing Euclidean quantum field theory. Okay, so there's a price you pay with Euclidean quantum field theory in that you don't have instates or outstates. And there's something called the Miani testa theorem that says you can't do it. Okay, so, so the way that you do it, the way that you measure pion scattering lengths and things like that, is you, is you work in a box of finite size. Okay, and you put and you calculate correlation functions for, say, two pions in the box. And now let's think about it physically. I've got these two particles in the box, and they interact with each other. So their energy is a little bit different than what it would be, right, if the box was larger, okay? And so what you do is you measure, basically, the energy of the particles in the box, and there's a rather elaborate construction. Uh, it's trivial in one dimension, you know, think about just having an attractive potential in a periodic box. I can show you, you know, the, the trivial calculation. In three dimensions, it's got annoying mathematics in it, but it's basically old-time solid-state physics. And what you can do is uh, you can extract, what you can extract is the phase shift in a particular channel from the finite volume, from the dependence of the mass of, say, the two pi on state on finite energy, and so there, on, on finite size. And so what people have actually done is, is there are calculations, say, uh, and then you can track this. You can vary the size of the system. You can inject momentum so your, your, your pions have non-zero momentum. And people have actually mapped out. They, can, they, can, they get data which they can unfold into basically the shape of the resonance for the rho meson. That's been done very well. People do things like the sigma, okay? Uh, there are people that do that. And then state of the art there is uh, three particles in a box. The guys that do dark matter, they really want to do three particle in a box because they want to do two to three scattering because they believe in two to three scattering. We can't do that for them and they build models. That's an active area of research. Uh, the, the effective QCD string, so I don't know if anybody has done that besides Mr. Flauger. Somehow lattice people, you know, QCD people have not tagged into that, maybe because there are other things to do. It's certainly you know, he did the, I remember, was it your Tassi that, that, was it four years ago when he was, when he was here? He's been here since I started doing it, and the two, it was at one of the formal Tassis, and I don't know if it was uh, two years ago or four years ago, because it's all gone away in my head, okay? Um, but what people are doing is basically they're interested in, so you have this string, and think of effective string models, there's a correction to the, to the energy of the string, which goes like 1 over L, and there are famous people's names associated with the coefficient. Uh, you know, is it a, is it a uh, uh, what is it, a, a, what are they, they, Naboo strings and somebody else's kind of string. 
and people are interested in looking at this universal behavior. People, people see it, maybe not as well as they should. Um, I think this is something, uh, write a proposal, get some computer time, find some poor graduate student, right? Uh, I think it's doable. I just don't know about it. Okay, good. I'm going to turn off my mic and not say anything for a while.